welcome to Since Time Immemorial Tribal Sovereignty in Washington State. Today I'm going to give you a very, very brief overview of the Discovery Doctrine, Treaties, Statehood, and Tribal Sovereignty. Believe me, all of these topics could be college courses in their own right. So just know that I'm just skimming the surface to give you a general understanding of how our state came to be and its impact on tribes. My name is Mrs. Brown and I am a history teacher at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. So in order to understand the complete story of statehood, you also have to understand what tribal sovereignty is. That way you can understand exactly the impact that uh, statehood had on our land-based people here in Washington State. I'm going to play the audio of this video because uh, the video will not record on a video. So if you do want to watch this, please pause this presentation and click the, the link and then come back to the presentation when you're done. Did you know that Native American tribes are basically their own nations? In fact, they've been that way since well before the start of American history. It's called tribal sovereignty, but protecting it hasn't been an easy task. Let us explain. There are currently 573 federally recognized Native tribes in the U.S., and every one of them has the right to govern themselves and their lands. Before the Constitution existed, before the U.S. itself existed, American colonizers struck tons of trees with the indigenous tribes and thereby recognized tribes as independent nations. And when the Constitution was enacted in 1788, it too recognized their sovereignty, not just from the federal government, but also states and foreign nations. But soon after, their sovereignty was put at risk. In the 1800s, a series of Supreme Court cases ruled that indigenous tribes were domestic dependent nations, meaning they had lost certain rights of a self-governing nation like raising an army because they were seen as inferior people in the eyes of the United States Supreme Court. But there were more challenges to come. First, the federal government tried relocating all tribal nations by exchanging their homelands with less valuable lands. Then, when the tribes failed to assimilate, the United States broke up reservations by a process called allotment. Allotment gave each tribal member a piece of land with the hopes that it would become economically productive. But instead, it resulted in the loss of millions of acres of tribal property. In the 1950s, Congress passed legislation that aimed to assimilate Native Americans into mainstream Western society. More than 100 tribes were terminated and had their recognition and sovereignty revoked. The result was a flurry of economic and social issues for the Native community, issues that persisted even after the policy ended. Since then, Native groups have regained some of their rights and the government has taken a more supportive approach to tribal sovereignty. Today, tribal nations work to rehabilitate endangered species, restore their traditional languages, and address the epidemic of murdered and missing indigenous women in Indian country. But the debate still isn't over because the right of Indian nations to self-govern is often being redefined and challenged, despite the fact that its history predates even the birth of our colonized nation. the vocabulary used in the video. Tribal sovereignty is a way that tribes govern themselves to maintain and develop their cultural, spiritual, political, and economic well-being. Treaties are formal agreements between two nations or governments. Manifest destiny, which is what we'll talk about today, is a belief that it was the United States' God-given right to take and control all lands between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Lastly, allotment was a process used in the 20th century that assigned individual ownership of tribal lands and then declaring all of the unassigned lands open for non-Indian settlement, resulting in checkerboard-like reservations, checkerboarding with tribal and non-tribal land. And so what gives them the right to claim indigenous land in the first place? It's something called the discovery doctrine. A doctrine is a belief or a set of beliefs or policies, rules, set forth by a political or religious organization. 
And so what happened in the 1400s is that the Catholic Church wished to build a Christian empire all over the world. And so in 1452, Pope Nicholas V, the leader of the Catholic Church, he releases what's called a papal bull. And you can just think of it as a bulletin, bull bulletin. And in it, he states that Christian monarch monarchs can discover non-Christian lands and not only claim them for their own, but specifically enslave all of the people there, exploit the lands, and do so for their own profit. This practice becomes known as colonization. So in 1492, when Columbus lands in Bermuda and he sees the people and the resources, he realizes the opportunity to exploit the people and the resources there in the Americas. When the news gets back to Europe, European monarchies all over, they flock to the Americas to claim land and people for their own. Spain does this, France does this, Great Britain does this, and other countries as well. Later, after the United States is formed, they continue this practice, except they call it manifest destiny. And it was at that time that the, the, the phrase discovery doctrine was actually coined or created. And so what ends up happening is that we see the large scale decimation or destruction of people and the exploitation of the resources. So to review, the discovery doctrine means that the first white Christian monarchy that plants its flag on indigenous soil gets to claim and exploit the land, the resources, and the people for their own profit, and that they can do so in the name of God. And so let's see how Manifest Destiny plays out all the way from uh, the, the east to the west and then the, the northwest to Washington state. During this time, 1.5 billion acres of native land is lost by treaty or executive order. And so what we're going to see here is it in action. The blue color here represents native land, indigenous land. And beginning with the establishment of the United States, the United States immediately begins moving west, moving west, moving west, and trying to build its own country and they do so at the expense of native people and native land. So they continue to seize land and move west. Now, in the 1830s, you're going to start seeing these little bits of yellow land. Those represent the reservations on which tribes are relegated to live in exchange for certain rights and, and uh, protection and health care and so forth. We'll go over that in a second. But you can even see now if we get into the 20th century, that after those treaties, you still see native land reduced by the United States. And it continues to reduce by various policies. And so now what we see today are the remaining reservations that are tribally controlled. Let's first take a look at reviewing so that we understand how Washington becomes a state. First, the United States identifies the discovery doctrine to justify obtaining Indian land. And the US defines its right in the 1830s as manifest destiny. In other words, it is their destiny. It is a foretold prophecy that the US will control land from sea to shining sea. During this time, indigenous people are reduced to mere occupants of the United States. They are no longer nations that enjoy complete sovereignty. And so begins the requirements for statehood. In order for a territory in the United States to become a state, it first needs to adopt a state constitution and then prove that the majority of the non-Indians living there want to actually become a state within the Union of the United States. They also need to have at least 60,000 non-Indian residents permanently living in the territory, which means that there was a, an intense desire to get non-Indians, white citizens, to settle in this area. And so that begins with the Land Donation Act of 1850 that allows white American men to obtain Indian land. That can be with or without consent. In 1853, Washington becomes a territory 
And that also means then that there's a race for Washington territory to become a state. So it is the primary responsibility of Governor Isaac Stevens, the first governor of Washington territory, to remove Indians through negotiating treaties as quickly as possible. And Stevens negotiated seven treaties from 1854 to 1856. The land was immediately opened for non-Indian settlement. And as a result, Washington becomes a state November 11th, 1889. The treaties that were signed by Governor Stevens and the, uh, the tribes in what is now Washington state actually limited sovereignty. There's a misunderstanding that treaties grant sovereignty to tribes when it's actually the other way around. Remember that tribes held complete sovereignty since time immemorial, since the beginning of time. And in 1830, the United States removed tribes and it was an incredibly unpopular practice. People couldn't believe that the United States was just seizing land and removing Indians. And so in order to placate public opinion, in, a, in other words, in order to make America happy, the US began the treaty practice in the 1840s. But that was really window dressing. The treaties gave an appearance of fairness, but really tribes were deceived or, co or coerced into signing treaties. And in fact, Governor Stevens warned the Yakima chiefs that if they did not sign the treaty, that their people would walk in blood knee deep. Chief Kamaikin was so angry when he signed the treaty that he bit his lip so hard that it bled profusely. And this was reported by M uh, Andrew Dominique Pambrun, who was an interpreter during the treaty council at this time. the result of the treaty. First, we need to define the, uh, the usual and accustomed hunting, gathering, and fishing sites, the homelands of the Yakima people, for example. We're going to use them as an example. And so when you take a look at this land right here, that's in this kind of salmon colored, that was defined in the treaty as the, as the homelands of the Yakima, the, the tribes and bands of the Yakima. And, uh, and that's actually kind of an error because the homelands and the and the the food gathering sites are going to be actually beyond that but for the purposes of the treaty they had to define the homelands there so then what ends up happening is is that the tribe agrees to move to this area in gray but retain the ability to hunt fish and gather in the in the other area the 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 usual and accustomed sites and so that means that the tribes exchanged the land but not their right to hunt gather and fish in their homelands and the u.s in exchange agreed to provide goods and services such as protection health care and education and that that was provided by the united states forever so these treaties are still in effect today Tribes held complete sovereignty since time immemorial. So that is since the beginning of time. Archaeological evidence, this is a conservative estimate that, that people have been here for 13,000 years. That the United States seized indigenous land through practices fueled by the discovery doctrine and manifest destiny. Treaty negotiations after the establishment of the United States tended to be deceptive and coercive. The U.S. opened the West to non-Indians and started uh, a treaty policy mostly to placate public opinion. But let's face it, if public opinion were that against the seizure of Indian land, then legislation would have been completely different, wouldn't it have been? So the public opinion might have been in the minority there. Treaties limit, they do not grant sovereignty. And so that when we take a look at the seven Washington State Treaty signed between 1854 and 56, we have to make sure that you understand that those treaties limited our land-based people's sovereignty. So in exchange for millions of acres of land, tribes retained their food and gathering their food gathering sites, 
their sovereignty over their reservations, payment for goods and uh, healthcare, education, and protection. Washington gained statehood in 1889, and the seizure of Indian land did not stop there. In the early 20th century, the United States started allotment, which further reduced the land base of tribal people. Now, today, tribes protect their treaty rights through the courts. And in fact, there are more Supreme Court cases about tribal sovereignty than any other case. And so it is really important that tribes protect those treaty rights and insist that those treaty rights are honored because those treaty rights are what help continue tribal people's existence and development of their nations. I want you to use evidence from today's lesson to defend or refute the following statements. Statement number one, Washington became a state through the use of racist practices and laws against tribal people. So I want you to be thinking about the Discovery Doctrine, Manifest Destiny, the Land Donation Act, the Allotment Act, and how they impact tribal people. And I need for you to, to determine whether or not those are racist practices. And so you'd be focusing on the racism of those practices, or you'd be arguing against that those practices were indeed racist. Statement number two, tribal sovereignty is essential to the survival of the land-based tribes of Washington state. And so I want you to think about there how the treaty negotiations, how the treaties limited, although they limited the tribe's sovereignty, they now outline the remaining tribal sovereignty and rights of tribes in Washington state. And so I want you to talk about how those treaties are essential to the survival of our tribes in Washington state.